All right, everybody, welcome to IAEI News Live. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich, and today we're going to be talking about the electrical hazard, and it all starts now. All right. Well, welcome to another IAEI News Live. I'm excited about this um, this session because I um, uh, it's it's a it's it's a topic near and dear to my heart. Electrical safety is uh, something we all should be very much aware of, especially if we are in the electrical industry. But what we're going to talk about today doesn't just impact those in the electrical industry because when you're on a job site or any, when you're in a structure around electrical equipment, uh, hazards exist. And, and the electrical hazard doesn't discern between um, whether you are an electrician or whether you're a plumber or you're a drywaller or you're a homeowner, whomever it is, or a maintenance person. It doesn't matter who you are. You need to understand and have a level of awareness of the electrical hazard. So today's session... I'm going to be referencing a few, I'm going to have a few references. I'm going to have the, uh, the 70E, the Electrical Safe Work Practice Standard for Electrical safe work, Safety in the Workplace. It's all about safe work practices. I'm referencing the 2021 version of this document. I will be hitting the National Electrical Code in various, uh, various times and a few other references. And we're going to close this uh, session with a, a good list of references that you might um, consider for your library. So let's talk about the electrical hazard. The first thing I want to get out of the way is that 70E helps us, defines uh, the electrical hazard as a dangerous condition such that contact or equipment failure can result in electric shock, arc flash burn, thermal burn, or arc blast injury. So we know we have, we have shock. Arc flash, and I lump arc flash and arc blast into the same uh, category. And you're, you're going to understand the difference as we move forward. Uh, it just sounds good, arc flash and arc blast. And then finally, you have thermal burns. We'll talk a little bit about thermal burns as, as well. And I believe thermal burns is relatively new to the definition of the electrical hazard. And again, remember, the electrical hazard is found in the um, Chapter 1, Article 100 of uh, 70E. So this helps us understand, no, number one, what we're talking We're not talking about falls. From an electrical hazard, I mean, there are, you, you, you have to think about where you're going to be working uh, in and around equipment. Uh, we're not talking about cuts and bruises and things of that nature. All of those are a part of uh, safe work practices. OSHA is another big reference for us. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be thinking about OSHA 1910 and 1926 because if you think about the rela relation be relationship between OSHA and 70E, I get this question a lot or I hear this question uh, during many safe uh, work practice uh, educational seminars. Uh, so inevitably, someone in the audience will ask the question, who enforces 70E? And I think what the, what's important to understand is the relationship between OSHA, because we know OSHA has laws, and, and we have to follow these, these uh, regulations and these, uh, these requirements. And OSHA, I would, uh, and I've heard this explained many times this way, OSHA is the shell and 70E is the how. So OSHA will tell you, you have to, uh, well, let's take a look. OSHA will tell us we have to, uh, what's in 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 one ten dot one? We have to focus on hazard elimination. Seventy E tells us that our number one priority is hazard elimination, and OSHA will tell you that we have to. OSHA tells us we have to create a safe working environment for the electrical worker, and that includes many aspects of working, not just the electrical hazards. Although we're focusing on electrical hazards, but it's important for us to understand nineteen ten for general industry, nineteen twenty six. For construction are your two key references in regard to this topic that we have today. 
but they reorganized uh, 70E in this 2021 version or edition of this uh, standard. And they, they, they ro- raise the awareness that your number one priority has to be elimination of the hazard. Now, if you look at 110.1, because 110.1 doesn't stand just on its own. They have two informational notes. And I want to read those because uh, I think they're, they're very critical for our, for our discussion here. Hazard elimination shall be the first priority in the implementation of a safety of safety related work practices. Informational number one says, informational note number one says, elimination is the risk control method listed first in the hierarchy of risk control identified in 110.5H3. And they, they're pointing us back to Annex F for examples of hazard elimination. Now, while I go back to Annex, um, Annex F for Frank, uh, I will point out what is risk. And I, and I think it's very important that we all understand risk, the two elements of risk, because in most of what we do, we do a risk analysis. We go through uh, the two key topics of likelihood and severity. What is the likelihood of an event occurring? And what is the severity of the ramifications uh, if that should occur? And and in some cases, the severity is acceptable. I might might have a very high likelihood that uh, a hazard exists, but the severity is... Now, I get a little tap on the shoulder, or um, I may just get frightened a little bit and you know get right back on track. The severity, if the severity is very low and the likelihood is high, my risk is relatively low. If the severity is very high, meaning shock, death, what's the, the, the highest severity is, uh, is death. When my severity is high, the likelihood better be low, if not completely eliminated. So it's important to understand, and I tell design engineers this, and I approach things myself uh, in, in, uh, from a safety by design perspective, with those two thoughts in mind, likelihood and severity if i can re- if the severity is high and i can reduce the likelihood and we'll talk about some scenarios in that regard uh, in a power distribution system if i can reduce the likelihood but the severity is high by making a design change i have increased electrical safety so annex informative annex f is not enforceable it's informative and it's titled Risk Assessment and Risk Control. They tell you in this, um, uh, in, in, in uh, F.1, I love this. It says risk management is the logical, systematic process used to manage the risk. And remember, we know what risk is. Likelihood and severity. So we're managing the likelihood and severity. The risk associated with any activity, process, function, or product, including safety, the environment, quality, and finance. The risk management process and principles can be used by organizations of any type or size. So so what it's telling us is associated with an activity. Think about uh, getting up in the morning and uh, getting in your vehicle and taking a ride to work. You have risk. You have likelihood and severity. And you know if you get into a big accident, the severity in an accident in a vehicle can be very high. The likelihood, what do we do? We follow the rules. We go to the speed limit. We add distance between us and the person in front of us. We're keeping our eyes out all the time. We don't drive if we're intoxicated. We don't look at our phone and read our phone. Every time we pick up our phone to look at a text, the likelihood has risen. Severity is still there. Likelihood could change 
from the time I leave my house to the time I get to my place of work, the likelihood of something happening bad in my vehicle can change based upon what? My awareness? My attention? My aggressiveness? So we manage risk. And risk management is logical, systematic, and it's a process. So NXF, great reading material. Um, just giving you some of the titles. Occupational health and safety risk management is uh, F1.1. F.2 F is relationship to OSHA and safety management systems. Hierarchy of risk controls in F3. Hazard risk assessment in F4. You know, that's, a, that's, that's an important aspect. I mean, you have the hierarchy of risk controls uh, dis, dis explained and described. Task-based risk assessments. So, and there's some tables and, and informative information here. So, one type one ten dot one informational note number one is um, is is an important uh, uh, reference, and it points us again back to Annex F. Now, informational note number two is a little bit more extensive. Let's take a look at that one. Uh, an electrically safe work condition is a state wherein all hazardous electrical conductors or circuit parts to which a worker might be exposed are placed and maintained in a de-energized state for the purpose of temporarily eliminating electrical hazards. So our goal is to get our electrical workers to establish an electrically safe work condition. And to do that, we need to understand what the hazards are. I mean, we can't, it says, all hazardous electrical conductors or circuit parts to which a worker might be exposed are placed and maintained in a de-energized state. If I don't understand what, a ha what, ha what are the qualities of a hazardous electrical conductor, then I can't achieve 110.1 priority. I can't establish an electrically safe work condition. So you know we're going to have a discussion about the qualified person at some point in our hour together. Article 120, Article 120 of 70E is titled Establishing an Electrically Safe Work Condition. And it's found on page 70E-20. And you'll, you'll notice that this article just kicks, the, kicks everything off with lockout tagout program. So if you're not familiar with lockout tagout, that's a challenge for you in establishing and meeting the top priority of 70E. So we have to understand the hazards, and then we need to understand how to establish an electrically safe work condition. And this discussion is about understanding the hazards. So you remember, Article 120 is, is, uh, is an important, uh, is, is, contains important information for you when you're developing your electrical safety program. And here's another, there's another uh, concept, another topic. Um, the 70E, yeah, it's not like you, you, when someone says, yeah, we follow 70E, uh, what does that mean, right? 70E is like the recipe. It's like, um, how, do I, how, how, how would I, uh, a good analogy would be, Somebody who says, um, I don't know, I follow the Webster Dictionary. When I, when I, um, when I write articles, I, I follow the Webster Dictionary. Hold on. The Webster Dictionary is just terms. They just help you to properly understand words. They don't tell you how to put it together for whatever it is that you're writing. And I would say that's similar to 70E. 70E has a lot of information in it for a small document. There's a lot of uh, guidance placed in here on lockout tagout policies and procedures, but your lockout tagout policy and procedure may, may drastically differ than someone else's lockout tagout procedures. Why? Because you have different equipment. The equipment in your facility helps establish the, the, the hazards that you might have in your facility, and that will be different than someone else. A residential safe work practices for a, per, a residential wireman 
an electrician is different than somebody who works in an industrial facility. The hazards are different. You say, well, Tom, there's, there's uh, arc flash. Is there arc flash? Are there arc flash hazards in a residential dwelling unit? Question number one. Uh, we have shock. We know that. Anything greater than 50 volts or 50 volts and greater, just shock hazard. We're going to talk about that as well. So you'll have shock hazards. You'll have arc flash hazards. Different levels, different severities for some of these tech topics. So Article 120 is a important reference for you. But the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about shock. Now, when you think about shock, you, I mean, exposed electrical conductors. Is every exposed electrical conductor a shock hazard? Well, what 70E tells us in 110.3, that energized electrical conductors and circuit parts operating at voltages equal to or greater than 50 volts shall be put into an electrically safe work condition. So if I'm less than 50 volts, I don't need to worry about a shock hazard, is what this is telling me. So let's take a look at 110.3. Now, uh, just, just to give you an ex you know, 110, Article 110 in 70E is titled General Requirements for Electrical Safety-Related Work Practices. So um, it's important to understand the titles of, of, the, um, of the articles. Always work your way back up. If you want to understand a requirement, keep going up, if, especially if it's like a first-level or second-level subdivision. You need to keep going further up into the code to say, what am I talking about? So what I know in 110 is that these are general requirements. General requirements in, uh, apply to all electrical installations. And this is telling me that um, 110.3 says the uh, energized electrical conductors, the circuit parts operating at voltages equal to or greater than 50 volts shall be put into an electrically safe work condition before an employee performs work. If any of the following conditions exist, let's take a look. One, the employee is within the limited approach boundary. Where do we know? That? What, okay, now we need to understand the limited approach boundary. So where are we going to go there? We're going to go back to, uh, there are tables back in, I believe it's Article 130, because that'd be work uh, involving the electrical hazard and the limited approach boundary. So remember, when, the moment you start talking boundaries, you're into Article 130. Why? Because you're talking about working in or working, working in a state where you have electrical hazards. So if I'm 50 volts or more and I'm working based on 110.3, the employee is within the limited approach boundaries. The limited approach boundaries tell us and, and if you look at table 130.4, E is in Edward A, and the title of that table is Shock Protection uh, Approach Boundaries to Exposed Energized Electrical Conductors or Circuit Parts for Alternating Current Systems. Less than 50 volts is not specified for exposal to movable conductors or fixed conductors. What, what's a movable example of a movable conductor? Um, I think your best example are your, your overhead lines, right? when you have uh, something that is, say, a, a service conductor that's coming down uh, to a facility that is uh, connected at both ends, but disconnected in between, and if it's exposed, then it would be, it could be a moving part. And, and there's different distances. So, so for example, uh, 120 volts, if you're operating at 120 volts, so, so in this table, 50 to 150 volts, your limited approach boundary for exposed fixed circuit parts, I think that's probably most of what we deal with, fixed uh, circuit parts, three foot, six inches. So if you're closer than three foot, six inches, then 110.3 tells me that you need to put those conductors into an electrically safe work condition. Three foot six. In fact, three foot six is good all the way up to 750 volts. So that's a key number. That's a key measurement for you. Three foot six inches. Remember those. Three and a half feet. You're three and a half feet from an exposed energized conductor. You're within 
If you're inside that boundary, you are within the shock protection boundary. And you need to establish an electrically safe work condition or what else. Once you're in that boundary, now you're in Article 130 and all of the requirements around work involving the electrical hazard. So now remember, this is not arc flash. This is not your arc flash boundary. This is just shock. Now, 110.4 reiterates the 50 volt number. Uh, remember, 110.4, again, we're still in 110 general requirements. 110.4 is telling us, 110.4 title is energized work. And, and if you just lay out 110.4, you have A is additional hazards or increased risk. B is infeasibility. So it's talking about when you can, when are you authorized to do energized work, right? So what this is telling us, so what 110.3 says, think about it. 110.1 says your number one priority is to establish electrically safe work condition. 110.2 um, uh, is general. Electrical conductors and circuit parts shall not be considered to be an electrically safe work condition until all of the requirements of 120 have been met. So, so that's your electrical safe work condition, right? So 120 is uh, what we just mentioned in the previous slide. That is your establishing an electrically safe work condition, right? So then 110.3 tells us, hey, look, if it's, uh, if it's greater than or equal to 50 volts and you're within the limited approach boundary, then you, you need to establish an electrically safe work condition. And then 110.4 says, all right, hold, hold on. We understand that sometimes you might not be able to establish an electrically safe work condition. And these are those times that we deem when you don't have to. And you can, we, I call it, and it's not a defined term, but justified energized work, right? And 110.4C tells us energized electrical conductors and circuit parts that operate at less than 50 volts shall not be required to be de-energized where the capacity of the source and any overcurrent protection between the energy source and the worker are considered, and it is determined that there will be no increased exposure to electrical burns or to explosion due to electrical arcs. Electrical burns. Think about that one. Because remember, one of the hazards was burns and a heat source so can think about even though i'm i'm less than 50 volts can i generate enough heat in components that could burn an electrical worker with their bare hands and i would say think about batteries maybe right think about just look at the process look at the equipment to understand um that aspect of burns now what we do know about shock 70E, you know, what put 70E on the map for many people? Incident energy. Why? Shock and all. I don't know. But 98% of fatal occupational electrical injury, in, injuries are electrical shock in nature. Informative Annex K. I tell you, if there's anything you want to read, you want to have your apprentices read, you want to have your electrical professionals, your plant maintenance people, Anybody in your facility, it doesn't matter if they are electrical work related, if they are plumbers, if they are HVAC people, it doesn't matter their trade. Annex K is an important one. It'll help you at work and it'll help you at home. And there's statistics, general statistics in K1. There's electric shock statistics in K2. Over 40% of all electrical fatalities in the United States involved overhead power line contact, over 40%. And, and think about downed lines, in, in, especially in times of uh, hurricanes, which I know New York and, and Boston and, and the East Coast just experienced some of that, or still has experienced the ramifications of that. And, and, and uh, these hazards the, from a from a hurricane perspective, from a natural disaster perspective, aren't going away anytime soon. So electrical industry injuries represent a serious workplace health, workplace health and safety issue to electrical and non-electrical workers. They're right here in Annex K, it's telling us. Just because 
let's say that you're a home inspector, you are, um, you are a plumber, you are an HVAC person, you deal with, uh, you, you, you're a fabricator, it doesn't matter. Electrical industries impact electrical and non-electrical workers al alike. Informative Annex K, very important section. Large share of non-electrical workers, well, approximately one half of incidents involving workers from outside the electrical crafts. Telling you, hazard awareness is not just for the electrical worker. This discussion that we're having today, this uh, awareness that we are going to be focusing on is not just important to the electrical worker. Over 30,000 non-fatal electrical shock accidents occur every year. Over 600 people die from electrocution each year. And electroc electrocution remains the fourth highest cause of industrial fatalities. This is just industrial. If I looked at the statistics in commercial buildings, commercial buildings, non-electrical worker related, just shock, the numbers are staggering. The numbers are staggering. And most of these injuries and deaths could be avoided. How? Awareness. Awareness of the hazards. Being able to spot a problem and establishing an electrically safe condition. I don't want to say work condition because you may not be working on it. If you walk up and you see an electrical appliance damaged and it's plugged in, you're not going to work on it. You just want to establish an electrically safe condition. You need to know how do I safely, how do I safely neutralize this hazard? It might be that you can simply unplug the appliance. It might be you don't want to unplug it. It might be that you need to go down to the circuit breaker and turn it off. So understanding the electrical hazard is an important part. Now, we've all seen these. We've seen the statistics and we're saying, look, the electrocutions are on a downward trend. And many people will simply say it's all because of GFCI. And I would say that can't be further from the truth. In my opinion, a lot has happened since 1970. Yes, GFCIs play an important role. But you know what else plays an important role? What we're doing here today, awareness. You know what else plays an important role? When was the last time you bought a drill that was all metal? Or a saber saw that was all metal, sawzall? How about a circular saw that's all metal? What do we have? We have double insulation. We have insulated handles. We have, in many cases, GFCI built right into the cord of what? A hairdryer. And that GFCI protection is not just GFCI protection. That protection will detect when the hairdryer is submerged in water. The technologies have advanced considerably, both on the appliance side of the business, in the circuit protection side of the business, and our awareness, our awareness of electrocutions and shock. Anything 50 volts and higher, remember that. So what does NFPA 70E tells us? NFPA 70E tells us in 130.4, which is titled Shock Risk Assessment. Now remember, we have to do a shock risk assessment and we have to do an arc flash risk assessment. And if you look at the shock risk assessment, which is 130.4, there are general requirements. You have to estimate the likelihood and severity. Remember, now severity on shock, shock is shock, right? I mean, death. I, I, I don't know how else other way other to explain it. I mean, you can't say, well, sometimes I, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let go. No, you don't have that decision. When, when electricity gets you, it gets you. So really we're, 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 we're talking about likelihood. We're talking about coming in contact with something. I think out of both hazards, uh, electrical uh, shock versus arc flash shock has got the, uh, as 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 uh, I think a little bit um, the challenge in both of these is is understanding the equipment. Obviously, I mean, 
And we're gonna chat. We're gonna chat about that. Additional protective measures, documentation, shock protection boundaries. What are our limited approach boundaries? So you you have to be able to estimate the likelihood and severity of shock. You have to provide methods for protection. You have to document. Let's take a look at what documentation is. The results of the shock risk assessment shall be documented. So you're going to you're going to identify the hazard. You're going to estimate likelihood and severity. You're going to look at what are the additional protective measures. Uh, if additional protective measures are required, they shall be selected and implemented in accordance with hierarchy of risk control identified in 110.5 H3. Hierarchy of risk control is all about trying to eliminate the hazards, uh, et cetera. And then you have your documentation. You document this. Then you get into your shock protection boundaries, understanding what your distances are. Remember that three and a half foot, three foot, six inches up to uh, up to 700 and some volts, right? 750 volts, I think it is. Uh, and this is where you'll find the the um, uh, your boundary uh, distances, your table 150, uh, 130.4 uh, EA, and that's your shock protection boundary. F is your limited approach boundary. Now, you have a shock protection boundary, you have your limited approach boundary. Now, your limited approach boundary, uh, there are different, uh, there's a different table. So now, that would be found under uh, limited approach boundary is one, t permitted by 130.4F3. And what you get into here, this is, this is this is when you know you're 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 you have a you have to understand who the qualified person is and who the unqualified person is, right? And depending upon who you're dealing with, when they enter either the shock boundary or they may not be able to enter the limited approach boundary, or you have a restricted approach boundary. So you have a shock protection boundary boundaries, which are limited approach boundaries and restricted approach boundaries. So for example, in table 130.4E, for um, uh, say, say you're at 480 volts, so you're at, you're at 150 volts to 750 volts face to face. Your uh, limited approach boundary is three foot six inches. Now, w w w f from, a, from a limited approach boundary, you, um, you, you're not allowed to have an unqualified person in the, uh, or is permitted to approach nearer than the limited approach boundary of energized conductors and uh, circuit parts. And then they'll tell us that's our three foot six. Then you have a restricted approach boundary. No qualified person shall approach or take any conductive, conductive object closer to exposed energized electrical conductors or circuit parts than the restricted approach boundary. And for that 480 volt circuit, that is one foot. And it says, no qualified person shall approach or take any conductive object closer than, so for a 480 volt system, one foot, but it, it varies based upon voltage. And, th and that boundary gets further back. So if you're into, um, if you're into say 4160, you're, uh, you're back at two foot, two inches. The moment you enter, you can't have a tool on you, you that, that is, that is uh, non-insulated and conductive. A qualified person is insulated or guarded from energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. This is in the restricted approach, approach boundary. This is the smaller. So you have a you have a further number, which is your three foot six. And then once you get into say one foot for four eighty volts, two foot two inches for forty one sixty, now you've got other special conditions you need to consider, and it's all in section one thirty point four shock risk assessment. We go over the boundaries. We got the shock protection boundary of the limited and the restricted approach boundaries. Understand those. But again, you've got to be able to under, uh, recognize the hazard. Now, before we get into arc flash, I just want to point out that I want to point out the presence of some important things. So when you think about equipment, I'm just looking for a picture here. So let's take this one here. 
if you're familiar with residential applications and you're, and you're familiar with residential panel boards, the hazards in equipment like this can be much different. You're, you're probably not qualified to be able to recognize the hazards here. You may not understand that just turning off power to this big gray box doesn't establish an electrically safe work condition. You can even do your lockouts and tagouts and follow all your other procedures. There may be other hazards inside here, like a UPS that's providing energy to power to meters, or maybe the UPS is lighting up those LED displays, those little computer monitors up there providing 120 volts. Now you have an internal source. Understanding your sources, understanding your power sources, your, your sources of voltage, 50 volts or greater within a piece of equipment is critical. And every piece of equipment is different. This equipment versus a different manufacturer's equipment. This is a switch board. What about switch gear? What about the motor control center? Motor control centers aren't, uh, um, aren't immune. You're still, you, still have to, you still have to consider the fact that the more complex a piece of equipment gets, or the system, so even think about a residential application. You have a panel board there and you turn off the main, you may or may not realize that there is an alternative energy source. There might be batteries, there might be photovoltaic systems, there might be wind generation. You might have a backup generator that when you turn off the main, the transfer switch uh, takes over and starts the generator. And if you're out of earshot of the generator, you may not know that there are parts and pieces within your power distribution system that are now still energized, even though you thought they were not. Multiple utility sources, depending upon the size of the, of the uh, facility. There's so many different things that can occur. Double-ended switchgear, is the tiebreaker open or closed? There are so many uh, things you need to be aware of, the more complicated the power distribution system gets. It's very convenient when you're working on a piece of equipment or if you're looking at a panel board, if there is a, 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 if there is a clear, if there's a disconnect and a piece of, and a raceway and the only raceway hitting that piece of equipment is coming from that disconnect, that's a very um, satisfying example of knowing you are establishing an electrically safe work condition simple versus complex is always better for the electrical worker. So, and now we get into, you know, that gets you into the discussion of safety by design principles, which is maybe another session. So be aware of shock, arc flash. All right, arc flash events. You have the light, you have the heat, you have smoke. Light. An arc flash event is going to produce light. So what do I think about? My eyes. I also think about your skin. I mean, these are, these are, this is like standing next to the sun. You're going to get a tan if you're not protected. And it's not just going to be a tan. It's going to be a lot worse than a tan. You've got the sound. Think about your ears and your hearing protection. You're in the middle of this. You're not standing, you're not standing behind a glass plate watching it from afar. You're right there smack in the middle of it. And something bad happened. That's experiencing light and sound, and obviously the heat. I mean, you can see the, the energy that's being released. And now you're going to start into the gases. And, and in many cases, we inhale these gases. So here, let's go back. So 
So you'll see, you can see the, the energy there. Think about that red that's there is that molten copper. We vaporized copper. We vaporized plastics. We vaporized steel. We can inhale it. The heat will burn you. The sound will break your eardrums. The light will damage your eyes. And then the pressure wave, which is the arc blast, can project projectiles or damage. It could be, it could be covers of, of, uh, of the enclosure. You can, break, you can break ribs. You can break your neck. There's a lot of things that can happen during this type of an event. We call that an ungood situation. Now, before I play this one, this video here does a couple things. One, look at the short circuit current rating. It's 5,000 amps. The available fault current is 65,000 amps. I am exceeding the short circuit current rating of this equipment. You know what's going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to achieve an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. The fault is not inside this equipment. The fault is right down here on the bottom. Um, let's take that out one second. The fault, you see this is, there's a lug right here. And that's a split bolt that's basically terminating creating a bolted fault on the secondary of this. So what's happening is fault current is simply passing through this equipment. There is, this equipment is supposed to be able to withstand via its short circuit current rating, that pressure. But as you, you know, when I misapply a product, I get, unfortunately, an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. This is what happens. All right, so that was that door. That door went about 50 feet in the lab. Now, what did we do? We created, we misapplied a severely misapplied a product. And the pressure, the components inside could not handle. I don't care if it's a circuit breaker. I don't care if it's a fuse. You exceed its interrupting rating or equipment like this. If you exceed the short circuit current rating, you're going to have a catastrophic failure. And if you're an electrical worker standing in front of it, the blast, the pressure, the heat, it's all dangerous. So proper application of the products. People ask me, what about the National Electrical Code? What's the relationship between the National Electrical Code and 70E? Well, if, if you would have installed that product correctly, you would not have had an available fault current greater than the short circuit current rating of that equipment. And that is a 110.10 requirement in, in the National Electrical Code. And the recent changes in the NEC, you, we saw many changes throughout the National Electrical Code raising the awareness of these ratings. And look at the, the latest one, and I think is, is a significant one, is in 408, Article 408. Let's take a look. 408 dot, you know, I could never find this one. 408.6. Remember, 408 is uh, titled Switchboards, Switchgear, and Panelboards. 408.6 is short circuit current rating. Switchboards, switchgear, and panelboards shall have a short circuit current rating not less than the available fault current. In other than one and two family dwelling units, the available fault current and the date the calculation was performed shall be field marked on the enclosure at the point of supply. The marking shall comply with 110.21b3. So what this is telling you, recognizing the hazard, is not just understanding how much voltage is there. It's also understanding 
has the equipment been installed correctly? In that case, the equipment was not installed correctly. That's an impending hazard. Severity is high. What's the likelihood? We can argue about whether or not you would hit a three-phase bolted fault if you would be. What's the likelihood of being more than 5,000 amps at that equipment? Obviously, in, in, in this example, I had much more than 5,000 amps. If that equipment was, um, was, was uh, it, it doesn't matter. As long as your available fault current is greater than, you can't predict whether or not you're going to have a bolted fault, an arcing fault, a ground fault. Remember, just like in selective coordination and other topics, you, you have to compare how much current will pass through this equipment with its rating. Properly applied equipment helps increase electrical safety. If it's misapplied, your hazard awareness alarms need to go off. So looking at an installation, it, you can have a I was on a roof one time. I, uh, it was a photovoltaic installation, PV installation. We get up on the roof with the electrical inspector. And I'm looking at, I'm like, wow, this is an impressive. I mean, it looked great. It was beautiful. I mean, the, the, the panels were all in a nice line and it was absolutely a beautiful installation. And he turned around and looked at me very seriously and he says, put your hands in your pocket and don't touch anything. I'm like, wow. And he goes, let me show you what's wrong here. Nothing was bonded correctly. Nothing was bonded at all. Every one of these panels were independent of each other. So, even though something looks really good and pristine does not mean the installation is free of hazard. It's really easy when you look at something and you see all the rust and you see the holes and you see the bent metal fabric, uh, the, the, the bent metal. It's what you don't see in some cases. You might look at a piece of equipment like this and say, it looks like it's brand new. But if it was misapplied from a National Electrical Code perspective, you're exceeding the short circuit current ratings. Your conductors haven't been sized correctly. The, um, the enclosures uh, aren't, um, uh, haven't been, uh, your, your, your conductor impassity from, from a temperature perspective, uh, the condition of, uh, of the environmental conditions aren't appropriate. There are a lot of different things that can happen. There's a lot of requirements in here. Right, that you need to make sure you're following. And if you, if you don't follow the National Electrical Code, then you are, you're creating a hazard. And now you could exceed the bare minimum requirements of the National Electrical Code, but if you haven't met the requirements of the NEC, the likelihood of a severe event can be high. So that is an important part of understanding the hazards. Now, we're talking electrical hazards, but realize you have electrical energy that you have in a facility. You have pneumatic energy. You have hydraulic energy, mechanical energy, thermal, chemical, and just gravity. There are a lot of other hazards inside of a power distribution system. If you're working on a motor and a rotating piece of equipment, if there's a conveyor belt, an elevator. There's a lot of different hazards that we as electrical professionals and non-electrical professionals face on a daily basis. Some of them electrical and some of them indirectly related to the electrical energy. We have to be mindful of all the energy in the power distribution system. They're all a part of the hazard. And we have to understand that every piece of equipment offers a different perspective. Every system is going to offer a different perspective. You know, if you just look at 70E in the um, lockout tagout, remember where, where was uh, lockout tagout, right? I know you're gonna say, Tom, that was in article 120. Because 120 is titled establishing an electrically safe work condition. And you look at the whole process of lockout tagout procedures and identifying the sources of energy and understanding that 
your, your situation, your system might present different hazards than other systems would. Understanding that you need to have all of your employees involved. You have to have proper interlocks. You have to have coordination of your lockout tag out procedures because in some cases you have to do apply one lock first before another lock. The process that you take might be important. You have all the equipment that you're allowed to use. You have complex and simple lockout tag out procedures. And remember, this is just a recipe. Every facility, you've got to think about when you get a piece of equipment and say you're in a manufacturing facility and you're in a process, that process, understanding the steps in the manufacturing process are critically important for you to understand the hazards. If you're an electrical inspector walking into an environment like that, you've got to think about all of these hazards, electrical and non-electrical, because you're in a position you could be. If you're in a residential home, perfectly fine. You understand the hazards around residential. When you're in a commercial or an industrial application, there should be a, a level of heightened awareness of all of the additional hazards. Now, another thing to think about, arc flash events bring with it pressure. We call them arc blast. And I'll tell you uh, that uh, there's some research right now going on in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission around um, nuclear facilities, experiencing what they call high energy arc flash heath events. And they've documented many cases. This is an example of the amount of pressure that can be experienced during a heath event, during an arc flash event that has an arc blast associated with it. it. Takes a lot of pressure to bend a door like that. It takes a lot of pressure to damage a piece of equipment like this. And it's happened and it continues to happen. We have to understand the arc flash hazard, the arc blast hazard. We have to understand the shock hazard. And we need to follow 70E, safe work practices. But even more importantly, we need to leverage safety by design to meet this number one priority, hazard elimination. That has to be your number one priority. One of the best and easiest ways to do that is provide lockable disconnecting means. NEC 110.25. Think about NEC 110.25. What does it say? What? Uh, let's take a look. I was going to say it's right there. No, it's not. 110.25 tells us if a disconnecting means is required to be lockable open elsewhere in this code, it shall be capable of being locked in the open position. The provisions for locking shall remain in place with or without the lock installed. And the only exception to this is locking provisions for a cord and plug connected connection shall not be required to remain in place without the lock installed. So circuit breakers and other switches have to have the provisions permanently there so that you can apply your lock and do your lockout tag out process. There are various locations within the National Electrical Code where there are provisions. So one of them, 410, Article 410, I believe that's in lighting, right? Luminaires, lamp holders, and lamps. 410.141. Let's go to 410.141. This is uh, just one example. Oh, if we go to B, the switch or circuit breaker shall be located within sight from the luminaires or lamps or it shall be permitted to be located elsewhere if it is lockable open in accordance with 110.25. If you just did a search in, in the National Electrical Code for 110.25 references, you would find a boatload of requirements to install a disconnect that is able to be lockable in the open position. 
So the National Electrical Code, you know, someone will say, how does the NEC work together with 70E? This is how it, this is how we do it. And you can't forget 70B as well, which gets us right into our references. 10 CFR 1910, this is your general industry regulations. You need to understand these. You need to take a look at what are the requirements for things like lockout, tagout, establishing an electrically safe work condition, understanding the hazards. 1926, and I'll tell you, OSHA has some good training, online free training that you can um, that you can access. I'll provide some links down below. The National Electrical Code, we just talked about the NEC. 70E, safe work practices. Stay up to date. If you don't know the latest changes to this document, you need to. You need to understand it. If you have an older version of this document, the previous version or older, you need to get yours updated. If your safety plan in your facility is based upon an older version of this document, you need to get it updated. 70B, safe work practices. This is moving, I'm sorry, sorry 70B is maintenance. Uh, uh, recommended practice for electrical equipment maintenance. So this document is going through a transformation as we speak. It is moving from a, you shall, you, you could, uh, you know, you might want to think about, and you know, someone else told me that it might be a good idea to a you shall document. This is moving to a standard. This is going to be moved. This is a significant advancement for electrical safety. I think you need to be aware of. And you're going to want to get educated on 70B now requirements, not recommended practices. So once this cycle finishes out, we're in between first draft and second draft right now. But once this cycle finishes out, this is going to be a shell document. This needs to be a part of your library regardless. 70B is an important aspect. Maintenance, condition of maintenance is critical for safe work practices. It's critical for recognizing hazards. 70B, keep that on your radar. And I'm going to give you another reference. This is from the uh, American Society of Safety Professionals, uh, ANSI ASSP. This is the Control of Hazardous Energy, Lockout, Tagout, and Alternative Methods. Great reference, great resource. Um, I, I think it's um, something also worthy of your library. And then obviously you've got your manufacturer's instructions, process instructions, your machinery instructions, understanding the hazards uh, and, and understand the fact that hazards will change based upon your facility. One person's safety plan is not the same as another person's safety plan. If you don't, for example, I have a motorcycle, I ride a motorcycle. My safety plan includes a motorcycle. You may not have one. And you may have you may have other little toys and and things that that um, that you need to be aware of from a safety perspective. If you're a welder, you have requirements for safety. Everybody has a different safety plan. My facility is not the same as your facility. The equipment I have in my and my processes aren't the same as your equipment and your processes in your facility. You need to be qualified. The qualified person will understand the hazards. And I, I say this, anytime you get training on a product, think about this. Anytime you get training on a product, the installation of a product, the maintenance of a product, whether it be a circuit breaker, fusible switch, panel board, switchboard, a receptacle, for goodness sakes. Any training you get on any electrical product, on a light fixture, on a treadmill, on a, um, on a motor, on a fan, any, any product that you interface with, the training you get on those products is a part of a 70E program of building the qualified person. Think about that. How can I recognize the hazards if I don't understand the solution? Take a receptacle pers for, for perspective which I have one in front of me here. You have, terminate, you have terminals on the receptacle. You gotta know which, which, what's energized, what is not energized. How do I determine what is energized? 
If I'm going to establish an electrically safe work condition, I need to verify absence of voltage. How do I do that on a receptacle? All of these, any aspect of a product is really a part of your electrical safety plan. And the single line diagram, I can't express, I, I can't tell you how important this document is. The single line diagram is like one of the most important pieces of information that you can provide your electrical worker. Understanding how to establish an electrically safe work condition, you need this. Which overcurrent device, which switch, which circuit breaker do you need to lock and tag out? Or which circuit breakers, which switches do you need to establish? open and lock and tag out. It may be multiple. Understand that the panel board that you're working on, that 208, 120, 208 volt panel board on the secondary of that transformer, I have my severity from incident energy just went up. Why did my severity for incident energy go up? Because I'm on the secondary of that transformer? Because the overcurrent device that I'm relying on for incident energy reduction is on the primary of that transformer. How do I pick that? That now this is this is again this is all about the qualified person. Think about what I'm talking about. How would I know the incident energy on the secondary of that transformer is much higher than any place else in my power distribution system? I know it without even doing an analysis. How do I know that? Because my protecting overcurrent protective device is on the primary of that transformer. And when I pick that protecting overcurrent protective device, I'm picking it. I am artificially inflating its size. Why? Why do I pick a large? If the full load amps of that transformer is 100 amps, do I pick a 100 amp breaker or a put in a 100 amp fuse? No. Why wouldn't I? Because I want that, that fuse or breaker to let the transformer energize. What am I thinking about? Inrush currents. Anytime I'm putting in an intentional delay, whether it be for selective coordination, motor start, motor inrush currents, in this case, transformer inrush currents, I'm adding an intentional delay. The energy on the secondary of that transformer is not going to be reduced because I have a very large overcurrent device. The panel board that is fed from a tapped conductor, a tap conductor. The overcurrent protective device is larger than the conductor size. Think about it. I have inflated my overcurrent protective device. The chances of my arcing current being in the instantaneous region, very low. Selective coordination in a selectively coordinated system. I know if this one line diagram tells me, hey, I see a transfer switch, I see an emergency disconnect or emergency generator, I know I have an emergency system per article 700, 701, 708, I know I'm going to be selectively coordinating that system, I'm going to have my severity is high with regard to arc flash. And then I'm looking for solutions. Did they put an arc reduction maintenance switch there or an energy reduction maintenance switch? Did they, do they have zone selective interlocking? Do they have arc quenching technologies? Are they able to address the incident energy? Did the design engineer think about that? These are all things you need to think about from a severity and likelihood. And the qualified person will know exactly what I'm talking about. Just when you thought all you needed to do was recognize 50 volts or higher, and put a lock on a disconnect. It just got more complicated. Sometimes it's not as simple as that. And that's the story today. That's my message. And I hope you got something out of this session. I really appreciate all of you tuning in to these Tuesday sessions. Um, please give me feedback. Let me know what you want to hear about things that you want to hear IAEI talking about. You're going to see more on the electrical hazard moving forward. You're going to see more on safety uh, by design principles and practices. We're going, to, we're going to be relating these two documents together. And soon, 
when 70B hits the streets, you know we're going to be talking about 70B as well, the trilogy. So thanks for joining in. Thanks for what you do for the electrical industry. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety. We all play a role in making things safer. Until next Tuesday, thanks for watching. Take care, stay safe, and God bless. I really enjoyed this session, and um, hopefully you did too. All righty, I'm going to, I am going to sign out. So take care, stay safe, and uh, remember, stay healthy.